Our, our uh, long form speaker today is Dr. Fouad Dezaji Bamani, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at Cal State LA. Uh, he will be exploring the theories of parallel universe, universes with us in a parallel universe. I said that correctly. Please welcome him. He takes Brian with him. They go through a variety of these things. Um, one of them in which uh, humans are subservient to dogs. Um, another one apt. Uh, another one in LA, I mean. Um, another one in which there, uh, Christianity never arose, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. I mean, the idea that there are parallel worlds um, is something that science fiction writers have like long been drawn to, there's lots of literature about it, lots of films, lots of movies. Here's a question, I mean, are there really some such things? Are there really parallel worlds? Uh, I don't know is the answer. I don't know whether there are parallel worlds, but what I want to try to tell you in this talk is that uh, there are reasons for taking that idea seriously. Um, there are several accounts in contemporary physics and indeed philosophy which suggest that this isn't just the stuff of science fiction, it's more than that. Um, and I'm going to tell you about three of them. Those three are, bear with me, uh, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, the multiverse theory in cosmology, inflationary cosmology, and finally something from philosophy which is called um, modal realism. I'm just checking my time. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot to get through. This is like super ambitious, but here we go. Um, so let me start with uh, quantum mechanics first. Do we have that first slide? So that will help. Um, so standard quantum mechanics, I hope you've all heard of standard quantum mechanics. Standard quantum mechanics is a theory about the very, very small stuff, atoms and their constituent parts, electrons, protons, um, neutrons, etc., etc. And in one sense, quantum mechanics is uh, remarkably successful. Uh, it's the, one of the pillars of modern physics. Uh, it's been around for about 100 years, more. And there are no known counterexamples, and it correctly accounts for a plethora of um, phenomena. And it hasn't been wrong. There's reasons for taking it seriously. Nonetheless, um, since its inception, I always worry when I say that, because people think, oh, is this like anti-science? It's like the opposite of anti-science. Uh, uh, nonetheless, there, uh, there is a problem in the, in the foundations of quantum mechanics. That problem is called the measurement problem. And I'm just trying to give you a flavor for that. Uh, Roughly speaking, quantum mechanics tells you that the behavior of very small systems is governed by two uh, dynamics. One which applies to systems up until the time that they're observed, and one which tells them how to behave after they're observed. Uh, so I want you to imagine the following thing. Imagine that you have an electron in a box. Uh, it's trapped in that box. And uh, you're interested in the question of whether it's in the left-hand side of the box or the right-hand side of the box. According to quantum mechanics, before you observe it, this is going to sound weird, but it's true. Before you observe it, uh, the electron is not on the left-hand side of the box. It's not on the right-hand side of the box. It's not in both sides of the box, and it's not in neither side of the box. It's in something called a superposition of states, uh, which doesn't have a classical analog. Um, but the good news is that when you observe it, it ends up in a definite space. It will end up either on the left-hand side or the right-hand side with a definite probability 50-50. Um, <clears throat> That's the standard quantum mechanical story. The problem with it, and this is the measurement problem, is that there is no systematic uh, way of determining what counts as observation. Uh, you might think that there is, but trust me, there isn't. Uh, and this has long been a problem for quantum mechanics. I mean, this, this problem has, hasn't been su successfully solved. Uh, this is where we get parallel worlds suddenly. There's an interpretation of quantum mechanics, and by interpretation I mean just an attempt to solve this thing which I call the measurement problem, um, which says that in fact there is no collapse. The idea that upon measurement the 
electron ends up in the left-hand side or the right-hand side, definitely, in fact, is not true. That sounds weird, and it has a very weird consequence. The consequence of that is that, in fact, the world, the universe as we know it, is branching out. So if you look at that little diagram, if, if you start, I wish I had a laser pointer, but I don't. Um, but if you look at that diagram in the bottom, you'll see that that's our world. And that what happens to this electron, according to this theory, is that, in fact, two worlds emerge. One in which there's an electron on the left-hand side, one in which there's an electron on the right-hand side. And this just happens all the time. And in fact, as you've sat here, if this theory is true, uh, many, many copies of you been, have been made. We're like almost exponentially multiplying. There are all these increasing possible worlds. Well, they're not possible. They're actual, according to the theory. Um, these parallel worlds uh, in which there are copies of you, um, all differing in the minute, minute details. Um, so, oh, that's nice. Thank you so much. Oh, that's good, yeah. Um, so, th that's the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. You've literally multiplied good news for you. Um, I'm going to now tell you about a... No, it's great. I mean, like, there are copies... You can be, if, if you mess up your life, it's okay. There are, like, an infinite number of yous who are just getting it absolutely right. It's great. Don't worry about it. Um, the second kind of uh, possible world, uh, parallel world that I want to tell you about uh, comes from inflationary uh, cosmology, essentially. So, uh, I'm in LA, so you've all heard of the Big Bang Theory, and most of you have also heard of the Big Bang Theory. So, uh, the Big Bang Theory, the theory, not the show, uh, tells us that the universe started 13 billion years ago, in a tiny volume, which is incredibly dense and incredibly hot, and it expanded, and as it expanded, it cooled, and good news for us, eventually, like little uh, subatomic particles form, they, they come together to form atoms. We've got stars, galaxies, nebulae, and all the stuff that we uh, love and care about right now. Great. Um, <clears throat> I take it that most of you think that the Big Bang Theory is true, and I think it's true, but the original version of the Big Bang Theory that came before the 1980s had a few anomalies, things that it couldn't explain. I'm just going to tell you about three of those things that it couldn't explain. Uh, one of them is that it can't explain the fact that the universe is extremely uniform. If you want to make that more precise, it can't account for the fact that the intensity of what's called the cosmic background radiation is the same in all directions. It just can't account for that fact. And yet it's true, we've observed it. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that it can't account for is the fact that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the early universe is very flat. Again, the standard Big Bang story doesn't explain why that's so. And finally, um, there's a distinct lack of a particular kind of fundamental particle. These things are called magnetic monopoles, and we don't see them. But if the original Big Bang theory were true, we would expect to see them all over the place, but we don't. So here are three anomalies, three things that this original Big Bang Theory cannot explain, uh, but which nonetheless we want an explanation for. Um, <clears throat> this is where inflationary cosmology comes on the scene. In the 1980s and 90s, a uh, tweak, is that a fair way of putting it? A modification of the Big Bang Theory was put forward, uh, which suggested that in the early universe there was this period of rapid inflation. Why that solves the anomalies that I've been alluding to is something that I can't give you right now. And, I mean, this is already extremely ambitious. Uh, but ask me afterwards, and I can <laughs> tell you uh, why it solves those problems. But it does, essentially. Um, the interesting thing for our purposes is that if this inflationary cosmology story is correct, story sounds too pejorative, this theory uh, is correct, uh, it's almost inevitable that there are an infinite number of other universes uh, aside from our own. Can we have the next? Oh, it's already up there. It's great. So, you know, our universe might be one of those bubbles, uh, but there are, I can't draw an actual infinity on a two-dimensional piece of paper. I'm just gesturing towards it. But there are an uh, uh, un, uh, uh, uncountable infinity of other parallel worlds, other universes, some of which uh, are very much like our own. The laws of physics are the same, essentially, and we're very likely to find 
stars forming and maybe there were some planets that look like ours and maybe there's someone that's dressed like you in that other world. Others are completely different and they don't have anything that looks like the things that we're used to in our worlds. They're, the physics is so different that stars wouldn't have formed, let alone planets, let alone sort of life as we know it. Um, so that's the second of these two stories about parallel worlds. How am I doing on time, timekeeper? Oh, this is great. I managed to do it all. Are we still together? Yeah. Are some of you secretly hoping that you're in the parallel world where this talk is over and you're eating ice cream? <laughs> I feel like that's probably the case. It's like, why, why does he sound so funny as well? Like his voice, it's like, it's a different accent. Um, it is, it's from London. Um, finally, this is in some sense the most batshit crazy of these types of parallel worlds. Uh, this is the kind of mo parallel world that you get in, uh, uh, in the context of philosophy. It's called modal realism. And I want to try to explain it to you. And in order to do so, I'm going to have to introduce a few um, philosophical concepts. Mm. Here's a sentence. I'm wearing a blue shirt. This is true. You're like, yeah. This is true. What makes that sentence true, the thing that I said true? What makes it true is that it corresponds to the facts, namely the fact that I am wearing a blue shirt. Great, you're thinking. Um, <clears throat> there is an old white bearded man in the sky dictating how atoms behave. There's a sentence. That sentence is false. Why is that sentence false? Because it doesn't correspond to the facts. There is no corresponding fact that makes that sentence true. What I've just given you is what's called the correspondence theory of truth. And it should be unassailably intuitive for you that what makes something true is whether it corresponds to a fact and it's they're failing to be a fact to which it corresponds makes that thing false. So far, so good. Now consider the following sentence. Um, I could be wearing a black shirt. It's a funny thing to say. Um, I'm not. You're all looking at me and you know that I'm not wearing a black shirt. But nonetheless, your intuition, I hope, is that I could have been wearing a black shirt. So I could be wearing a black shirt right now. I just am not. So you want to say that that, and this is called a modal proposition. It's a proposition that involves talk of possibility. You want to say that that modal sentence is true. And yet, if you buy into this thing that I call unassailably intuitive uh, correspondence theory of truth, well, that sentence comes out as false. Weird. So philosophers have been in the business of trying to give us a systematic way of making sense of this modal discourse, this way of talking about possible states of affairs as opposed to the actual state of affairs. And the thing that they came up with was something called possible world semantics, according to which a sentence of the form, it's possible that Foad is wearing a black shirt, is true, not because it corresponds to the facts of the actual world, but because it corresponds to facts at a possible world. So it's true that I could have been wearing a black shirt precisely because there is a possible world, not this world, but a possible world, in which I am wearing a black shirt and everything else is the same. Um, <clears throat> If that looks too simplistic or like too straightforward, take it from, well, I want, I want to try to motivate for you that this, this thing that I'm calling this possible world semantics is an incredibly powerful tool that philosophers use. Can we have the next slide? And to get a hand or just a flavor uh, for why it's so powerful, and shout out to Nick Thorburn uh, for doing these great cartoons. As you can see from the previous slides, I'm terrible at making slides, but this guy's like a talented dude. Um, so I want you to consider the following counterfactual. Well, okay, maybe some of you don't know what's going on in this image. This is a cartoon representation of Oswald shooting Kennedy. Um, uh, artistic license, I don't know, I didn't. <laughs> maybe he was wearing shorts, I wasn't even there, I wasn't born, I don't know. I'm not even sure who Kennedy is, to be honest, I'm just using this example because it's American and it was in some textbooks. Anyway, um, there is Oswald shooting Kennedy, it's great. Uh, oh, it's not, it's terrible, but okay, it's great for the purposes of this talk. Um, now, here's a counterfactual. If Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy, someone else would have. Let me say that again. If Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy, someone else would have. Now, notice that that's distinct from saying, if, if Oswald didn't shoot Kennedy, someone else did. 
When I say, if Oswald hadn't shot Kennedy, someone else would have, I'm implying that, in fact, Oswald did shoot Kennedy. But I'm saying something about a possible sequence of events, not the actual sequence of events. What I'm saying is something modal. I'm trying to say, well, look, if Oswald hadn't done it, someone else would have. I know he did it, but there was this conspiracy set up, and it was inevitable that Kennedy was going to be shot. We want a systematic treatment for these kinds of sentences as well. We want to say when a sentence like this counterfactual conditional is true and when it's not true. And uh, possible world semantics gives you the following answer to this question, is that counterfactual true? Um, uh, this, is that the second one? Oh, okay. Huh. Uh, one of these is supposed to represent the following situation, the situation in which Oswald, um, we need to go back one, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is correct. Um, this is the first scenario that I want you to imagine. This is the scenario in which Oswald on the right in the shorts um, misses Kennedy, but this, a second terribly dressed shooter, uh, in fact, gets Kennedy. So this is a possible world. It's a possible world in which Oswald fails to kill Kennedy, but someone else doesn't. And uh, this world, this final world, is a world in which both Oswald misses and this second shooter also misses. And here's what possible world semantics says about that counterfactual conditional that I asked you to consider in the first instance. It says that that counterfactual conditional is true just in case the second of those uh, possible worlds, i.e. where they both miss, is further removed than the first of those possible worlds. I.e. if amongst the possible worlds where Oswald in fact misses, the one that's closest to the actual world is, where, is one where someone else manages to kill and assassinate Kennedy. So possible world semantics gives you a systematic treatment of modal propositions. Um, and according to it, there are these possible worlds out there. Now, most philosophers, no philosopher I know, doesn't use possible world semantics. But David Lewis, a philosophical hero of mine, actually, um, went one step further. And he said, this isn't just a useful way of talking. This way of like, talk, thinking about modal propositions isn't just a useful fiction, says Lewis. We should take possible worlds seriously. In fact, Lewis says, there are concrete possible worlds out there. We're at just the actual world, but they really are these other distinct universes where all these scenarios are in fact playing out. We just don't have access to them. So that's a, like a very radical kind of parallel world scenario. In fact, there will be universes out there in which there's just an empty teacup sitting, doing nothing in like empty space. There's a universe in which I'm wearing a black shirt. There's a universe in which both people miss uh, Kennedy, Oswald. Um, it's, it's an incredibly rich uh, possible world scenario. And the really interesting thing is that you get this sort of embedding of parallel worlds, if that's true. Because there will be a parallel world, one of these possible worlds, as per modal realism, in which something like the multiverse theory in cosmology is definitely true. And there'll be another one in which, uh, for sure, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is true. So that will be a world in which there's branching. OK, so let me just summarize. I've tried to, I know this is tough, huh? this is like, wow, OK. But the good thing is also there's another version of you who like totally gets this stuff and is like very content. <laughs> this is easy, dude. Prove a theorem for me. Faster, let's go. Um, there are three kinds of parallel worlds that I've tried to introduce you to. The first is um, the, the kinds of parallel worlds that you get from uh, quantum mechanics, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which says that every time there's this kind of quantum event, uh, the world is branching into sort of parallel worlds. There's the parallel worlds that you get from inflationary cosmology, which says that uh, not only did our universe sort of come out of a big bang, there, was, there were an infinity of other universes uh, also coming out of this sort of primordial quantum soup uh, which gave us our universe. And finally, there's the really radical uh, position of modal realism, which is that there are an uncountable infinity of possible worlds 
um, one world for each way that the actual world could have been. Um, and I'll stop there. Give it up for the doctor.